Welcome again. In this session, we're going to be reading Luke chapter 6. So we're, we're going to be talking about the Lord of the Sabbath. We're going to be talking about the 12 apostles. Blessings and woes. Love for enemies. Judging others. A, true, a tree and its fruit. And the wise and foolish builders. So let's get on with this. And we're going to start with um, Luke chapter 6. Verse 1. Now on the second Sabbath after the first, he was going through the grain fields. It's commonly believed that these grain fields, by the way, were corn fields. His disciples plucked the heads of grain and ate, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said to them, Why do you do that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day? Jesus answered them and said, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him? How he entered into God's house and took and ate the showbread and gave also to those who were with him, which is not lawful to eat except for the priests alone? He said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now, we need to make it very clear here that uh, the Pharisees were quite dumbfounded by Jesus' reply. The Pharisees hated Jesus. Uh, not all of them, but a good part of them did. You know, there were some good Pharisees. For example, Paul himself, the Apostle Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Uh, he said in the book of Philippians and also in the book of Acts that he is a Pharisee. He doesn't say he was a Pharisee, he repented, he changed. No, he says, I am a Pharisee. Okay? He always was a Pharisee. Right to the day of his death, he was a Pharisee. Um, but the Pharisees knew that there were allowances for certain things on the, on the Sabbath. They knew that there were exceptions to the rule. They were just trying to get Jesus on something. They were just trying to prove that he was not as holy as what some people thought he was. So, he's, you know, they said, why do you do that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day? They knew, or they, at least they should have known, that it was lawful to do that. You know, um, most people would know that, it, you know, in even in the Talmud today, uh, the oral law, the Jewish oral law, it is allowed to do certain, th you're allowed to do certain things on the Sabbath. Um. So, eating when you're hungry, okay, it, it doesn't say anywhere in the scriptures that you are supposed to obey the Sabbath so strictly that even if you're starving, that you're not supposed to have food, okay? Let's say you're on a you know, it's, it, it's a Sabbath day, and you meet somebody who's starving, and it's, the, it's their last day of life. They need to have food. Oh, you don't get many food because it's a Sabbath day. No. God's not like that. If you know the law of God, you know that there are allowances for mercy in, in these kind of situations. Um, that's why Jesus brought out the whole uh, scenario of David when he was hungry. Uh, how he did what he did and it was considered to be okay. Even though it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't what would you call it, lawful, according to the surface of just, just looking on the letter of the law and just on that one particular command. But if you, if you know the whole law of God, if you know the, the heart of God, uh, then you understand that being hungry is something that God is, um, you know, is concerned about. He made human beings to need food. Um, so, yeah, I mean... You know, uh, Jesus made it very clear time and time again, you know, he had compassion on other people who were hungry. He fed the 5,000 when they were hungry. He said, oh, don't send them away hungry. Okay, so yeah, there are uh, allowances for this kind of stuff, especially on the Sabbath. And even today, uh, you talk to any of the, even the Orthodox Jews, if you were to say, you know, can you, if someone's in desperate need of help, can you help them on, a, on, a, on, on Shabbat? They would say, "Yeah, you can help them." I mean, if it's if it's a 
if it's a thing where they absolutely need help, then help them, yes. It's not like you're not allowed to do anything good on the Sabbath. It's not like you must obey this command even if it means means breaking other commands. No, you got to you got to look at the entire context. The other commands of loving your neighbor, about doing good and, and feeding the hungry and looking after the, the widows and the fatherless and all that kind of stuff, it's got to be taken into account. And uh, uh, you can't say that you will break all the all of the rest of these commands just because just to obey this one command. Okay. So, uh, yeah, you got to take it all into account. You got to take it into context and you got to know where it fits in the scene, okay? So verse 6, It also happened on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught. Again, very interesting. Jesus could have, you know, started his own little house church or, you know, built his own church building and, and started services. No, he went into Jewish synagogues and he taught. There was a man there and his right hand was withered. The scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether or not he would heal on the Sabbath that they might find an accusation against him. Isn't that something? I mean, isn't that, isn't that horrible that people are looking for ways to accuse someone else? They're looking, uh, they're looking for things for someone to do something wrong so that they can accuse them. Isn't that a horrible thing? Verse 8. But he knew their thoughts, and he said to the man who had the withered hand, Rise up and stand in the middle. And he rose and stood. And Jesus said to them, I will ask you something. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? To save life or to kill? Good question. Sometimes you're brought into a situation where you, you have to make a choice. It's either you do good or you don't do good. And if you don't do good, you do harm. Right? For example, you got, uh, you know, an old lady crossing the street and a truck is coming. And the truck is not slowing down. You can go out there and grab her off the street and quickly do good and save her. Or you can do harm and do nothing. And just watch her get killed. What do you do on the Sabbath? Verse 10, he looked around at them all and he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He did and his hand was restored as sound as the other. You see what Jesus was doing here is he was just bringing balance. He was just, you see, sinful man has a tendency to like to lord it over other people. Make unnecessary regulations. Make unnecessary rules. Make unnecessary policies. People do it all the time just to make themselves feel good. It's just a pride thing, you know? Just, oh, you know, just, just to throw your weight around. Jesus hates that. Verse 11. But they were filled with rage and talked with one, one another about what they might do to Jesus. Why would they be filled with rage? Again, these people have got a completely twisted view on life and on the way the the Torah is to be interpreted and practiced. They're more concerned about obeying the Sabbath than they are about uh, helping a, a man uh, out of his uh, pitiful state. Verse twenty. Uh, excuse me, twelve. In these days, he went out on the mountain to pray, and continued all night in prayer to God. Again, you see, Jesus prayed very fervently all night. When it was day, he called his disciples, and from, from them he chose twelve, and he named them apostles. Now, just before I start reading this, uh, I just it just came to mind, uh, because somebody might say, why twelve? Why did he choose twelve? Well, you know, he said to them in, in another por uh, por portion of Scripture, he said, you, I will set you on 12 thrones to judge the 12 tribes of Israel. So there was 12 apostles representing or leading or judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Here are their names. Verse 14, Shimon, Simon, or Simeon, okay, whom he also named 
Peter, or Kepha in the Hebrew, Andrew, his brother, James, which would have been Yoko, um, excuse me, Yaakov, or Jacob, John, that's Yochanan, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, another James, Yaakov, the, sons of, the son of Alphaeus, another Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who also became a traitor. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples. And a great number of the people of, uh, from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon and uh, who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, as well as those who were troubled by unclean spirits, and they were being healed. All the multitude sought to touch him, for power came out of him and healed them all. He lifted up his eyes to his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor. God's kingdom is yours. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be filled. See, it's very important to be humble here. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Very, very important to be humble. Blessed are you when men hate you and when they exclude you and mock you and throw out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For their fathers did the same thing to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Okay, now, keep in mind, woe is, is the opposite of blessing. It's a curse. Did Jesus ever curse? Oh, yes, he did. He cursed people. He, cursed, he even cursed a, a tree, okay? He cursed a tree. He cursed people. He cursed individuals. He cursed groups of people. He even cursed cities, entire cities. Woe, cursing, to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe. When uh, the TR adds all, but uh, in, in the NU would be, it would not say all, but woe when men speak well of you. Okay? It's not a good sign when people talk good, of, t say good things about you. Say, was old Uncle Jack in church. Boy, he's a good man. Everybody respects him. He's a really good man. Everybody praises him. Everybody loves to shake his hand and smile and say good morning. That's uh, something you should be... Should have a red flag on it. Woe when men speak well of you. For their fathers did the same things to the false prophets. And we see that today so many times because there's so many false prophets out there. It's all, all they do is just blessing people, blessing people. God bless you. God loves you. has a plan for your life. God's going to get you a new car, a new house, a new, uh, you know, God's going to bless you with this. God's going to bless you with that. God loves you so much. God's grace is upon you. God loves you. God loves you. God's grace, God's love, love and grace, love and grace, love and grace, love and grace, love and grace. Peace, 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 peace. As Jeremiah says, when the, when the false prophets say peace, they're not going to get peace. They're going to get the opposite of peace. That's false prophets. So the f people speak well of the false prophets because the false prophets, all they talk about, all they pro prophesy is good, blessings. They want to be popular. They want to feel good. The feel good gospel. 
Real prophets are not like that. Real prophets will call you to repentance. Real prophets will, will talk about the judgment of God. Real prophets will talk about hell. Real prophets will talk about the condemnation of God. Real prophets will call out sin and call you to turn from it. Verse 27. But I tell you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. Him who strikes you on your cheek, offer the, uh, also the other. And from him who takes away your cloak, don't withhold your coat also. Give to him who asks of you and don't ask him who takes away your goods to give them back again. Now, you got to realize here, is Jesus teaching anything new? Not at all. You know, we got Exodus chapter 23. We got Leviticus chapter 19. In the Torah of Moshe, in the, in the books of Moses, it teaches the same thing. The enemies you are supposed to bless. You're supposed to help those who hate you. Help those who are enemies. If you see an enemy, one of your enemies that are, that's walking, you know, that's, that's got a heavy load, go help him carry the load is what the, what the Torah says. G what Jesus was teaching here, he was just more or less unpacking the Torah. He was unpacking what, what Moses already taught, what Moses already taught, uh, you know, wrote about in his books. The instructions, the rules, the guidelines of God. Verse 31. As you would like people to do to you, do exactly so to them. That's called the golden rule, is it not? Do you want people to do this on you? Well, don't do that on them. You want people to treat you in a certain way? Well, treat them a certain way. Now, of course, that's gen generically speaking. We got lots of other things to consider, like justice and, and, and so on and so forth. I mean, you can't let all of the criminals go free uh, or else we're not going to have any justice at all or else we're going to have a very wicked, very wicked uh, and a very violent um, society to live in. We don't want that. Verse 32. If those who love you, no, excuse me, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. See, Jesus calls you to go above. Some Christians say, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Pfft, you're not. If you're a sinner, you're not saved. It's either you're a sinner or you're a saint. Okay? Um, Jesus called you to rise above sin. He called you to do things a lot more better than sinners do. You know, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you in verse 32? For even sinners love those who love them. Jesus is basically saying you better be a lot better than a lot of the sinners, okay? Verse 33, if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. Again, he's calling you higher than the sinners, okay? If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, if you just give just to get, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive back as much. But love your enemies do, and do good and lend expecting nothing back and your reward will be great and you will be the children of the Most High for he is kind toward the unthankful and evil. So, again, Jesus is talking about loving your enemies. Again, this is all in the Torah. This is all in the law of God. He's just expounding on it. He's just telling you more ways to apply it. He's, he's just bringing out more meaning, more, you know, more. He's, I, he's not taking the law of God away. He's driving it deeper in you. Verse 36, therefore be merciful, even as your father is also merciful. Very good point. He says, don't be like these sinners, but be like the father. Take the father, be like him. May I bring to your attention, I want to submit to you that the law of God is the character of God. When God told Moses, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. Here's the guidelines. Here's it. He just said it because that's his own character. 
Don't commit adultery because God doesn't commit adultery. Don't kill. Don't murder. In other words, God doesn't murder his beloved people. You know, don't, um, don't steal. God doesn't steal. Therefore, be merciful, even as your heavenly Father is also merciful. Okay? So, again, let's look at this for what, what Jesus is really saying here. He's saying, look at God here. The Father is our example. Okay? And the whole law of God is just a reflection of God. Verse 37, don't judge or you will be judged. Don't condemn and you won't be condemned. Set free and you will and you will be set free. Now, again, I encourage you to go back to my teaching on Matthew chapter 7, because Matthew chapter 7, Matthew gives you a lot more detail here into this teaching. And I give you a lot more detail and insight into this teaching as well. So when it comes to judging, go back to Matthew chapter 7 and, and, and uh, check that out. Because this is that, Matthew chapter 7 is the, is the famous judge not lest ye be judged. Okay, but Jesus was talking to the hypocrites, obviously, because he said, you have a plank in your eye. Remove the plank out of your eye first. Then you can judge. John chapter 7, he commanded his disciples to judge with righteous judgment. So, yeah, it's important uh, to judge. You cannot obey God without judging. Jesus said, beware of wolves in sheep's clothing. You cannot beware of wolves unless you judge someone as being wolf. Jesus said, beware of false teachers, beware of false prophets. You cannot beware of false teachers or false prophets without at least judging somebody as being a false teacher or a false prophet. Hello? Uh, you cannot obey God without judging. So these stupid, ignorant fools that just say, well, judge not. Jesus said, don't judge. No clue what they're talking about. Jesus was talking to the people who were judging others for doing the same things that they are doing. In other, way, in other words, I can't judge someone else for making, for making and teaching on this because I'm doing it. Okay? If I judge someone else for doing that, then I'd be judging myself. You know, judge not or else you'll be judged. But I can judge someone for doing something for for presently doing something that I used to do but I've repented from. I can say, "Hey, what you're doing is wrong. I've done that before and I've repented and you need to repent too." Nothing wrong with that, buddy. Nothing wrong. Don't condemn or you won't be condemned. That is of course in context. We're talking about condemning someone for doing the exact same things that you are presently doing. Not what happened in the past 10 years ago or something like that, okay? Set free and you will be set free. Again, this is, you know, also, you know, alluding to forgiveness as well. Set people free and you will be set free. Verse 38, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will it be given to you? Literally into your bosom, which means into your lap. Um... Basically, you, you, you'd have so much, you, I mean, you'd just you'd be given right into your lap, okay? For with the same measure that you measure will be measured back to you, okay? So in context, again, going back to verse 37, you can't read verse 37 without reading verse 38 because verse 38 is, is what Jesus is talking about. What measure you measure will be measured back to you. With what measure, uh, you know, whatever you give others will be given to you. Okay, so again, you cannot condemn someone for doing something that you are presently doing. Um, you can condemn someone for doing something that you have done in the past, but have changed. You have, you've repented of it. That is removing the log out of your eye, removing the plank out of your eye, and removing the speck out of your brother's eye after you've removed the log out of your eye. Verse 39, he spoke a parable to them. Can the blind guide the blind? Won't they both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. 
Why do you see the speck of chaff that is in your brother's eye, but don't consider the, the beam that's in your own eye? Or how can you tell your brother, brother, let me remove the speck of chaff that's in your eye when you, when you yourself don't see the beam that's in your own eye? You hypocrite. Again, look at the context here. Jesus is talking to hypocrites, not to his beloved holy apostles. First, remove the beam from your own eye. Then you can see clearly to remove the speck of chaff that's in your brother's eye. So yes, you can remove the beam out of your own eye. And then you will have uh, the, the right to remove the, the speck of chaff out of your brother's eye. Verse 43. For there is no good tree that produces rotten fruit. Nor again does a rotten, a rotten tree produce good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For people don't gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings out that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings out that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth, his mouth speaks. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, when you don't do the things which I say? Hello, grace preacher? Hello, grace Christian? Uh, excuse me, the, we have a little problem here. Uh, Jesus taught works. Matthew 25, he said that when in the, on Judgment Day, between those who go to heaven and go to hell, will, they, he will divide between the sheep and the goats based upon their works. Here he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things which I say? Okay, I know some of you might say, well, there was the thief on the cross. He, he uh, Jesus said, you know, today you'll see me in paradise, and he didn't do anything. Oh, yes, he did. He repented of his sin. He didn't, feel, he didn't only feel sorry, but he showed great remorse and change of heart. Big, big difference between, um, you know, someone, uh, you know, hanging on a cross who actually showed repentance, humility, and a change of heart and to those who don't and just rely on so-called grace or faith to get them in. Hey, uh, time to reassess. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, when you, and don't do the things which I say? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them and does them, I will show you who he's like. He's like a man building a house who dug and went, went deep and laid a foundation on the rock. When the flood rose and the stream broke against that house and could, not, and could not shake it because it was founded on the rock. But he who hears and doesn't do. Uh, a lot of people who just trust in this, you know, soda fida, this whole thing, and just faith alone, not works. You know, it's just grace alone. You don't have to repent, all this kind of nonsense. This is where you fall into. He who hears and doesn't do. These people believe, but they don't do. Is like a man who built a house on, earth, on the earth without a foundation, against which the stream broke, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Doesn't sound like salvation to me, boy. Doesn't sound like salvation to me. As you go thinking about the scriptures that we've read, uh, remember, these scriptures that we read today were in Luke chapter 6. And uh, as you go, meditating, meditating upon these uh, wonderful precepts of God and the laws and rules of God, uh, may God enlighten the eyes of your heart grant you the gift of repentance, grant you to see things, great and mighty things, which nobody has ever seen before within your circles or even within your family. So as you go, God give you mighty revelation and, uh, and give you great peace and joy in his word and in obedience to his word. 
Thanks again.